overcome that artificial skepticism, and the sheer agreeableness of animal faith will protect us from excessive caution and sterile suspension of belief. In other words, we instinctively exercise faith in all sorts of circumstances. And that faith protects us from both excessive caution on the one hand, and on the other hand, it protects us from a sheer failure to believe in anything at all. Friends, if you don't exercise faith, you wouldn't get up in the morning. You would only use milk that you got from the cow yourself. You wouldn't drive a car, you wouldn't trust in the traffic lights, and you certainly wouldn't get on an aeroplane. So the question becomes, not is faith rational, because I think we've established that it is, within certain parameters, rational. The question becomes, for me as a Christian, is faith in Jesus rational? Is faith in Jesus rational? And the only way to answer that question is by an examination of all the evidence. And if you haven't examined the evidence for Jesus and yet you have dismissed him, well, isn't that a blind, irrational faith? It's not atheist. It's not agnostic. It's actually agnostic. It's ignorant of the knowledge that it is rejecting. It doesn't know what it's rejecting because the evidence is purely prima facie rejected based on presuppositions that are unchallenged and unexamined. So that describes you. Please don't be agnostic. Uh, examine the evidence for yourself. And you'll see that faith in Jesus is completely rational because it's based on sound evidence that is within the realm of probability. So let's look, for example, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, Christianity is a historical religion. Its validity rests on whether historical events actually happened or not. And then the resurrection is central. It's central to Christianity. Christianity succeeds or fails based on the resurrection. And so Christians affirm what our scripture teaches and what our experience as humans showed to be true. That every one of us is inherently selfish. We, we all take good things and make them the ultimate thing, the thing that we want to live for. And so we ignore God and we live for ourselves. And that's simply what the Bible calls sin. And its effect is to break our relationship with God, to uh, divorce us from God and cause disharmony in the world. And it puts the curse of death over humanity. We all die. There's only two certainties in life. Death and taxes. You guys might not have to worry about taxes at this stage, but we never know when death might be round the corner. And so Jesus came as God in the flesh to die on a cross for my sin and your sin, and then he rose again to show that death and sin was finally defeated. And faith in the resurrection is rational because based on all the evidence, it's the only conclusion that makes any sense. So in Jesus' day, the Jews said that the disciples stole the body, they paid the Roman guards to say that the body was stolen while they were asleep. But if they were asleep, how do they know who stole the body? And surely they would have woken up if someone tried to move the big stone from out the front of the tomb. So skeptics will say that, okay, well, it was the Jews or the Roman authorities who stole the body. But if they stole the body, then why didn't they just bring it out to prove that Jesus rising again was a lie? All they had to do was produce the body, and they would have proved that it was false. Well, another theory is that the women were so upset with grief, and in the dimness of the early morning, they simply went to the wrong tomb. But we're told that they saw where the body was laid. The angel talks to them about who it is that they're looking for. And anyway, if they went to the wrong tomb, again, why didn't the Roman or Jewish authorities just go to the right tomb and bring the body out? 
Again, that would have proved that it was false. Well, then there's the problem of the women witnesses themselves. Hard for us to believe today, but at the time, women weren't thought to have any credibility. If this story was made up, then surely they would have had men as the main witnesses, and not Mary Magdalene, who used to be a prostitute. Why would someone make that up? Unless it was true. Unless it really was what happened. Okay, well, skeptics will say that Jesus didn't actually die. He just fainted. It was a hot day. He'd lost a lot of blood. The Romans thought that he was dead. But later, in the cool of the tomb, he woke up, came out of the tomb, and appeared to his disciples, who mistakenly thought that he had risen from the dead. But then how did Jesus, with a spear wound in his side, and nail wounds through his hands and through his feet, and crush lungs from hanging on a cross? How did he then survive without <coughs> food or water or medical treatment for three days, have the energy to move the stone from the inside, fight off the guards, and then walk for miles to appear to the disciples at a town a long, long way away? You know, blood and water spewed from his side when he was pierced. That's a sign of death. Pilate had a centurion, an experienced army officer over 100 troops, checked that he was dead, and that centurion confirmed that he was dead. To believe Jesus didn't live and die on this earth is irrational, blind faith. Let's base our decision on Jesus based on all evidence. Well, that's just the Bible, I hear you say. Well, even Josephus, a Jewish historian, with nothing to gain from recording these events, he gives us external third-party evidence that this is true. He wrote about Jesus and he refers to his death on a cross and he says that he appeared to his followers three days later. This is the record of reliable history recorded by Josephus, recorded by Tacitus, a Roman historian, non-Christian historians outside of the Bible, all claiming that Jesus lived and died and rose again. And you see, the problem with all these theories that don't actually tell us what happened to Jesus is they don't then go on to explain the appearances of Jesus. If the body was stolen, then how did Jesus appear to so many people over the next 40 days? The disciples weren't on drugs. They weren't hallucinating. They weren't seeing a ghost because they actually saw Jesus. They spoke with him. They touched him. They ate with him. If we're to be rational about Jesus, we can't ignore the evidence. And then how do we explain the amazing transformation that came over the disciples? You know, before the resurrection, they were frightened and scared. They had Peter denying Jesus three times. He, he runs from Jesus and said, I never knew him. He runs and hides. They denied any involvement with Jesus. Yet after the resurrection... They went around everywhere proclaiming the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's a major turning point, not just for the church, but for history. How do they change so dramatically if all along they knew that it was based on a lie? How did they then go on to face the test of torture for their beliefs, to face the test of martyrdom for their beliefs, 